Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, my name is Stuart Easton from Transparent Choice, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Amanda Oakenfall, uh, delivery executive at, at IBM, uh, ex Deloitte, just all round good egg, Same. real, real project soldier. Been, been doing this for a few years, right, Amanda? Not we won't yeah, say over how, five. Yes, over five is good enough. Quite a few. <laughs> over five is good enough. Um, and uh, and today, uh, given that it's it's more or less Valentine's Day, we thought we would have a little bit of a Valentine's Day theme. I even put a jacket on for you, Amanda. Um, oh, I was wondering. You yeah. dressed up for the occasion. I did. I dressed up for the occasion today. And we, we love having Amanda on because um, Amanda is, as I, as I mentioned, very experienced, but but a real expert in... Uh, turning around broken projects. Yeah. Uh, shall, we, shall we put it that way? Um, yeah, I'm a recovery specialist. Yeah, I'm, the one, I'm, I'm the ghostbuster they go to when things are, haven't gone well. Exactly. And so today we're going we're gonna to look at when, you know, it's Valentine's Day. So we're going to look at when you're in the relationship with the wrong, yeah, the wrong one, the wrong project. And yeah. we're going we're to explore that bit, have a bit of fun. And um, uh, Amanda's in the office, so she doesn't have a glass of wine. It's early in the morning here, so I'm I got a cup of tea. But if you if you want to grab a a box of uh, uh, hankies, box of tissues, so that you can you can cry a little while you watch, that would be just fine. So, or a bottle of wine. Or a bottle of wine. <laughs> or a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so happy Valentine's Day, and uh, and let's let's dive in. Um, so Amanda, let's let's kick off with with the worst question of all, which is, you know, just tell us a little bit about your background. Oh yeah, that is the worst one of all. Um, started uh, in multiples of five years ago in uh, project management in the military, um, and a blessed thing there is they do teach you the they do teach you well. I, I give them that in hindsight, they do teach you well. So I started at the very bottom, and uh, worked through project management as a trade out of the military into consulting and I've worked uh, for those in Australia uh, through SMS which uh, then I was asked to join EY, worked with them on their building their practice uh, and then asked for some recovery work requirements with Deloitte, uh, worked a number of their portfolios and programs um, and I have hence uh, transitioned myself into IBM to be more tech focused. So I'm still doing the same thing, just uh, I've got another t-shirt on this time. Excellent, excellent. And, and um, you know, one, one of the things that, that made you the perfect person for this topic is, is this reputation you have for, for turning projects around. So, so, mm -hmm. so let's start with a really obvious question. Right. How do you how do you recognise when when you, you're in love with the wrong project? Uh, generally, someone up, up there is sitting there and is money hemorrhaging everywhere. Which, of course, financial is. I'd like to just call out to everyone. That's a lag indicator. Um, anyone who focuses predominantly in their financial bottom line through their program. And I'm going to get the ire of quite a few people, no doubt, but I'm happy to stick my reputation on it. Um, your finances will be that lag indicator. So if you're hemorrhaging um, your, your dollars, uh, you are definitely on the downturn and you need to recover. That's generally when people start sat ringing me saying, I, I just, I just, I don't know, I just try, because they have, at, at that point in, in life, in a project life cycle, they are so focused on, on that financial indicator. And of course, it's, it's like rubbing it, it smoke because the project's ahead, the lag indicator is telling you, you you're diving down and they just keep getting worse and they keep digging into it, which just tells them more and more that it's not doing well. So you've got to sort of grab that program and turn it around. Um, but that'll generally, a good 80% of the time, be the one that tells you why you're in a bad relationship. So, so and why your project's not good. So, what's the, so, so just talk me through some of the characters then in that situation, because that, that sounds mm -hmm. like that could get quite emotional. So, so yes. what, 
So what's what what is the PM going through? What's the portfolio lead going through? What's the I don't know if it's a, an IT. <laughs> what, what's the CIO going PM's, through? The PMs at the pub are pulling the hair out after hours. You know, just generally doing a lot of this. Um, your, your portfolio management person is probably whipping the stick at him, going, "Come on." Why haven't, what's wrong? Look, it's not, I've got an indicator here. My KPI says, you know, and so, which makes him feel worse. Um, the CIO's walk in paces because the business generally, if it's IT led, obviously, that's why I like to play um, predominantly, although I do do capital. Um, yeah, he's walking, walking the floor. His business is saying, you know, we're losing hours. We're losing, you know, profitability, our productivity is down. Um, you know, why is it that our call centers can't log the calls quick enough and they're now typing them on paper and, and stone and chiseling things in just because they're using whatever they can. Um, and then you've got the CFO just, oh, having a hernia because the CEO has got the board ripping down his neck because you know, no one's happy. The whole family are a bit ticked off with each other. They're probably not communicating very well. That's, and mm -hmm. you tend to start see by the time I'm being called, it's unraveled. Like this is, we've got clash of person. Well, it, I was going to say clash of personalities. It's not really that. It's just that people stop communicating. Yeah, the tension. Um, yeah. Talking, the tension is getting over them. And you've got to come in and grab that and then nestle it into, into something a little bit more reasonable. So, so, what's, so, so what's really interesting here is that, you know, of, often people think of a you know, project going wrong as just being a project going wrong, right? You know, maybe we'll save it, maybe we won't. But, but you know, I, I want to be really clear on this one. You know, if, if it's a big enough project, mm -hmm. not only end your career with that company, mm -hmm. you could end the company. Mm -hmm. you, you very, you know, it's not uncommon to see... CEOs, mm -hmm. get, CEOs getting fired because a project's gone wrong. Yeah. Uh, if it's a big enough one. Yeah. Government's getting scrutiny too. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so, so this stuff, this isn't, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of statistics. You know, how well did we do? How many did we get over the line? It's, you know, there's real business impact. And, and, and in a way, more importantly, there's a real impact on people's lives. You know, people, mm -hmm. they lose the jobs, they lose... Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it can be really messy. So, so this is actually, you know, it's a, a pretty important thing. And, and can... I, I can I just comment on that? It's just popped into my mind. We was in a conversation um, recently where a lot of people feel the project management methodology. Right, I've just read the book. I've, I've, I'm prince-tude. I'm pinbocked. I'm, you name it. Uh, I've, I've got a certificate, I went to uni, we've got this piece of paper, it's really great. We put it, it's a mechanism, it's a machine. That's a project, it's a machine. Now, I, I cannot disagree more. Project is organic. It lives, it breathes with the people that are in there. It's a family. It's not just a team. You're generally wedded to this bunch of people, particularly the ones that, that I do, I'm generally wedded with them for years. Like we take yeah, it could be 18 months, two, three year pro programs and projects that we're looking at. Um, so it, 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 they are a living and breathing organic uh, thing in their own right. They grab their own culture. They become their own person, their own personality. Uh, and, and being able to work with that is very, very, being able, being able to read it, breathe it, get to know it, learn it really quickly. Uh, to be able to turn it around is vital. It's it's not a methodology. You mm. you just can't throw throw a method at a bunch of people and think you've solved the problem. It's not going to work. Yeah, that's why the counselling industry goes off so well in, <laughs> in relationship breakups. To be fair, I mean, if it was just so easy as you one one is two, um, we we wouldn't have those people around either. So it's it's, it's it, definitely it, a lot more. It's interesting. Early in my in my sort of project oversight type uh, career, there, there were a couple of projects that were badly off the rails, and, and I had no PM training at all. I, I couldn't even spell Pimbok at, at that stage. Mm -hmm. And but we managed to turn those projects around. And and the only thing 
that I think I contributed to that because you know the, the PMs and the, the delivery teams really did the hard work. But the only thing that I did that, deliver, that, that contributed to that was get people talking and get people focused on what are we actually trying to achieve here, folks? And then identify the roadblocks and get rid of them. And, and so it was purely commercial. Um, and it was no methodology. It wasn't about methodology at all. It was about humans. But in that I think you could, in, in retrospect, you could probably put a methodology up next to it and say, yeah, we pretty much took most of it. it probably. Oh, yeah, yeah probably. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we had PMs who were all certified and everything else. So I'm sure the methodology yeah. was just fine. Uh, I think the point was the, 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 the only difference, the methodology isn't enough. Right? The no. methodology is not what gets the job done. No. Methodology is is um is kind of um it's it's, in it's, fact, factor. it's just it's just you know it's like brushing your teeth in the morning i've, I've got one for you um i <laughs> the methodology can sometimes you could throw it out the window uh i'm in a, a earlier program of work i'd been involved in we actually went live without being able to get through any of the gates <laughs> because because there's one uh, PMO person that we were involved with who would not accept that the schedule was adequate because they were trying to get earned value out of it. I said, you won't be able to get earned value out of it. And they wanted us to schedule down to daily tasking. I said, we're not going to schedule down. to. So we went through the entire project and in the final um like sign off once we've gone through hypercare, once we've actually delivered. I'm like, I, I wanted to take a photo of our acceptance criteria because it was always, you know, at the bottom as an exception. We've we've not we've not accepted the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've gone live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's live and it's up. I can look back at that. Yeah, so you always have that person involved. Well, not always have that person, but that person does exist in the family, <laughs> and you're allowed you're allowed to go live with one of those people in your family, who will tick and flick a register, even though it has got nothing to do with the fact that you can or can't deliver. Excellent. So I think that's <laughs> I think that's actually a really good good time to talk about. And there's a bunch of stuff, right? There's there's you know, it, it is. I mean, it's it's a great topic because it's it's just like uh, a relationship, you know, with your special other. Mm -hmm. You can you can have the you know you can pick the wrong person, and everyone around you can see it's the wrong person. Yep. Oh God. Yeah. That, right? And we'll we'll come and we'll talk about that in a little while. But let's stick with this idea of you know right. We're we're we picked our person right. We picked our project. We're running with it. The wheels have come off. We're hemorrhaging cash. Everyone's running around with their their hair on fire. Um, and you just started talking about registers and tools and things, right? So, so how are we going to how are we going to turn this around? How are we going to stop looking in the rearview mirror at the at the smoke we're leaving behind, and how we how and and start looking forward to how we're going to fix it? So, what 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 are some of the key kind of mindset change, tool change, process change? Ooh, I so suppose when we when we land, you know what? It, it's different. The first thing I listen to is I'll I'll actually go and you're gonna you're gonna pick this one. I'm gonna look at the strategy. Right. But what, what are we here to do? Are, are you doing what is right for the business? I'm gonna have a talk to the executive. And I and another thing I pick up on is how are they talking? It's very interesting to see. It's just like family dynamic. It's a relationship dynamic. Are they yelling at each other? Uh, are they you know, speaking kindly? How's the body language? Body language is key as well. You know, <laughs> I've, I've walked in and had people turn around and, and it's just, uh, you know, I'm not getting a room with them. Willing to tell me that, but not willing you know, and then you've got to work all the dynamics out. Right. And that's, art. I mean, it, it works in parallel. So it's not only about what you're there to do. You know, is it aligned to strategy? Are you actually achieving what you, your business needs you to achieve? But it's also how are you doing it? I did, there was an incident um, where I've come across a coup, a chief operations officer who flatly refused to speak to the CIO 
and they would use their their yeah they'd use their personal assistants to no. pass files to each other. No, because <laughs> the relationship between them had come it had broken down that much. And and look, you you it's it's not the first; it won't be the last. It's just that the it. And as we said before, it comes from the pressure of where you're pushing to achieve the impossible. You've got yourself in a situation where you're still continuing with something that really had either died years ago, has no reason to be anymore, uh, should have been cut off. But a, a lot of people at that stage, it gets very emotional. They've put years some stages from business case development right through where they're working hard to you know, to get what they perceive as this brilliant thing and it started off as a great idea but either the business moved in a different direction you know technology moved in a different direction um, all of a sudden investment moved in a different direction and and whether that would be capital investment whether you're looking at technology changes but all this emotion that's in you, the blood, sweat and tears, and they just can't deal with letting go of it. And you've got to come around sometimes. Sometimes we close the projects. Sometimes we walk in and it's like, no. And watching people's um, faces as they look at you and say, well, I built my career off the back of this. You know, yeah. this is, yeah, this is, it can't, I can't say that. Well, and, 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 I mean, th that's one of the main reasons frankly, that we, that we started Transparent Choice, right? So, so um, you know, I was going to say that businesses make decisions. Actually, people make decisions. And those decisions, yes, they affect the, the business or the government department or whatever it is that you're working for, but, but they really affect the human beings in that business, right? So the people who put their, put, get up every morning you know, put, put, on the, put on the Superman suit and go to work and, and do incredible things every day. And, mm -hmm. and those people know when they're working on something that's not adding value. They're not, they're not mm -hmm. stupid. And, you know, so, so we saw, for, as, as an example, we saw um, there was, a, actually it was an Australian government department and they, about 20% of their project resources were working on project uh, projects that were being consumed that everyone knew were a complete waste of time right they just weren't mm -hmm. supporting the goals of the organization and everybody working on those projects knew that they you know that they were working on stuff that really wasn't adding value and, and did, I they think have that's that's over? did so, you were able to see if they if did the did that particular role reversal did that particular um business would they have had a high uh, turnover staff turnover they they well uh, you wouldn't they, have they, did a, they did a bit and and they relied a lot on the particular kind of area that they were working in they, they relied a lot on um uh, volunteers and oh. so what they saw was that there was a lot of kind of stress and, and a bit of turnover in the, yeah. in the volunteer ecosystem in particular um yeah and, and, and ultimately, you know, it came down to being able to step back and, and not yeah. just look at that project, but look at the whole portfolio and just say, look, what, what is it that we're trying to achieve? And, and mm. what they discovered and, and what, what I think you described beautifully with the, with the you know, using the, the PAs to pass files between <laughs> them, right, was the, the, I mean, that's an extreme example, but fundamentally, <laughs> the, the executive team wasn't aligned on what they were trying no. to as a business no, and that, that's all it was it was a communication breakdown that's yeah. completely what it was once once you can articulate that to them and, you, and you're able to break through some of those barriers and translate what's happening into something real that they can deal with and and then you start to see the mechanics start going again and the relationships start building again um, sometimes it takes to grab a, a project or a program of work and you're like well we got to tweak it sometimes it's about the people uh it can be about you know it, a numerous amounts of things but to turn that around you got to, you got to get to the core of the issue put the issue on the table um i also tend to find those i've always said this if you've got a if you're pointing the finger you've got three pointing back at you don't point the finger we don't look back 
we got to where we are. We look back, we're going to look at that veil of smoke and mist out the back end. Um, and no use looking back at where you were. Look through the windscreen at where you're driving because otherwise you're just... And if the more you point fingers, the more you're going to make the whole situation a heck of a lot worse. The other one I tend to find is areas of accountability and responsibility. Sometimes I get people and I like that, that they like the piggyback projects. And we've all seen it. I'll say this out loud. A lot of people don't talk about it. They'll piggyback a project because they like to be involved. They're not actually helpful, not doing anything. They don't like the responsibility. Of it. They don't like the activity involved, um, but they want to be part of it. And, and sometimes it's, you've got to pull out the people who are weighing down your program because, again, they're a cost. It's, it's, that's, that's really lovely. It's really enthusiastic. And I enjoy your enthusiasm to be here. But you're very quick to notice that if... Uh, if you're not picking up activity and you're benefiting this project, you're not delivering, I don't need you on the crew. Yeah, you need you, you can go somewhere, get off the boat, go back to shore because you're not working this, this vessel. Mm. Um, and you can, you can, you have to make those decisions. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And I think it's the same thing with, with the, the projects themselves. So we're all, as you can tell, we're, mm. we're, we're still locked down here, right? So I, 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 <laughs> I'm on lockdown okay, version yeah. three now. Um, so uh, uh, I can well, brag. Yeah, it was yeah. around the other way a few months ago. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, so it's been really interesting as as COVID COVID bit, and um, you know, organisations around the world just stopped projects. Yeah, you know, I mean, they just stopped everything. And, yeah, that was fun. Uh, and just focused on. You know, how do we survive? How do we enable people to work from home? How do we, you know, just how do we survive? And then slowly started enabling projects again. And you know, one of the one of the most common themes when I talk to execs now is um, how amazed they are that the, the the company didn't just topple over and die. You know, the world didn't <laughs> stop revolving. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm. I'm... <laughs> Yeah, and they're kind of finally waking up to realize that actually there's a, there's a lot of stuff and nonsense in my portfolio, things I don't yeah. actually need to be doing. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, so so the, the the PMI data suggests about one in five projects are so badly aligned with your your goals that they should be stopped tomorrow. I think it, the phrase is something like yeah. that in the report. I forget exactly what it was. You know, one in five should be stopped tomorrow because it just doesn't support your goals. So, no. so, so, I mean, so when you go in to fix projects, how often is that the situation? How often do you find that they're just so bad, you know, that, that it just doesn't support you? Uh, you need to have that hard conversation. So I, for me personally, um, it would not be that many. And it's only if I'm coming in to help uh, where I find if I do a portfolio analysis or I'm helping, then you can see some of those smaller triggers. Um, I'm currently, and I tend to work some of the big ones. So the big ones, you're not going to stop. The big ones, and I'm, I'm talking 25, 30, 40 mil above, you, you're not going to, those ones have existed for a reason. So they're usually in a recovery mode if they get called in with something they feel is kind of going a bit wrong. Um, they're either lost productivity, we're not going to hit target dates, uh, you know, go lives aren't going to reach. I had one where we had capital build then we had, a, we, we demolished a, a building and we had infrastructure upgrades plus an IT coming through. Now, that, th these are types of things you're not going to stop. Um, if you do a portfolio assessment, which are very quick uh, assessment against you know business initiatives where the business is going what the strategy alignment is but you've got to dig further than just strategy just don't open up your strategy book and think that someone wrote that perfectly you've actually got to dig in and have a look and a discussion with the board a discussion with the ceo what was the intent behind this strategy uh because you know there's some quality uh deliverable sort of flux in the strategy documents that i've ever come across as well so it, that that takes a bit more more digging into to actually know if if you've got a project that you're too in love with and you're just wedded to it there's a 
do you, you know, it's a bit like a, a really, it is like a bad relationship. Do you, are, are you going to stick in your current relationship that you, you're not kind of happy with the current project, but you know, if you could, you know, tweak it a little, things will get, you know, you get the spark back. Or is it at the point where it's like we've diver- we're off on different tangents, we've grown apart, you know, the business wants to go left and my project's deciding to drag me right. Um, that type of analysis is something certainly at the portfolio and programmatic PMO level when you're doing prioritisation and reassessment. I don't often find a lot of reassessment being done. There's prioritisation that they keep going through but do they reassess these projects? Oh, well, it was on the list. It got mm. on the list 10 years ago. It's been on the list for 10 years. We, we prioritise it at the bottom. Now, how long have you had that project there? Oh, we've, we've had a, two BAs, a PM uh, and an architect working on it for at least the last five years, just waiting until we kick it off. Really? Do you need it? You know, is it, ha, have we reassessed this? Are, we, mm. are you sticking with the same relationship just because he was there yesterday he was there last month yeah yeah, he was there six months ago so you know well we're committed now we've put x amount of dead dollars in resources into it so Mm. you know we're not going to blow that investment away we're sitting here for five years with this guy you know it's just not giving this this up and 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 it is it is hard i mean this is this is sort of what Mm. what we do as a business is this prioritization and selection piece and it's it's I mean, you've, you've nailed several things in that in that little segment. So, so the, the first one is that, you know, that strategy document, mm. that strategy document wasn't written for you to be able to select projects off it, right? It, it, uh, so, so uh, and, and very often what you find is that um, strategy documents can, can be very difficult to translate into the real world. Um, mm. And so there's, there's some kind of, you know, you need a bridge that helps focus that right? and, and translates this strategy document into something in portfolio land that we can actually use to assess projects. Um, uh, and that's, that's kind of what we do. And, and as part of that process, you know, what we, we always recommend that, that the prioritization thing actually becomes just part of your normal governance meeting, yep. right? Yep. Let's, just, let's just look at the chart and has something moved? And if it's mm. moved, let's make a conscious decision. What we do about that? Do we do we cut and you know get rid of it? Do we yep. add, put additional resources? Do we go and get Amanda to come and fix it for us? You is, know, what do we what do we do with it? Is the desktop upgrade that we've had on here for five years as an intent really still needed, or are we happy to still work off our old you know nineteen eighties machines? <laughs> Yeah, is it, is it? And if it, if it is supposed to be here, um, maybe we should actually do something about that because yeah, there, there's a it, it's it's been very interesting to come across some portfolios and just whittle away to find you've got a, a BA stuck in the back corner that's been there for ten years and she said, oh well, I just do the assessment every day on on whatever it is she's got to audit against and you're just waiting for the project to kick off. Well, that's a, so that's an interesting one. Uh, so the the um, uh, sometimes we see this really interesting thing where you've got the BA sitting there just doing, you know, I, I'm just going to do do the work, turn the handle. Yeah, and, his and business not, pace development's usually a good one. Yeah, and, and not really thinking about it. You know, not really thinking about what's the impact of this. Um, so I'm thinking of one customer in particular where, yeah, you know, there was this person doing that piece. And she was kind of sitting there going, oh, I don't really care. You know, there's this way that we assess them and, and we score we score our projects. And, and, you know, I don't really know why we score this way. I don't really understand what these metrics mean, but I just go through the process. And I'm sitting there going, well, okay, so somebody's making decisions off of that. Okay. And, and then you talk to the executives at the, at the top yep. of the organization and they're yep. sitting they're sitting there going, ah, we've got this prioritization process and it's, and it's yeah. wonderful. And we, and, uh, you know, and, you know, and I crack the whip and I make sure they do the, pro- and you're sitting there going, okay, so, so we've got someone steering the wheel that they think is connected to the, to the front wheels. <laughs> they're going like this. No, they're in different cars. Yeah. They're, they're <laughs> completely different cars, you know, and, and there's just, and, and they're on different roads. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. just, it's completely, completely crazy. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so you know, I think I think one of the things in terms of getting the right projects, make sure that process actually works. Make sure it's joined up, and make sure it starts with that strategy. So you got me. I'm off on, on my hobby horse now. I mean, this is what we do all day long. So I, I get very enthusiastic. Um, but but you know, it starts with that strategy. You're right, and 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 mm. getting the leadership team aligned before you do anything else because you ca you can't if you if if, you, if the leadership are trying to pull you in different directions then you can't make good decisions it's as simple as that the other interesting thing about this is that a lot of the executive consider pmos prioritization ppm work to be administrative and what very much frustrates me about that is that they should have a seat at the table of the executive mm. because I don't know many executives that are well-versed in reading um, the nuances of a portfolio and they rely heavily on uh, reports, again, that a quality variant can be vast, absolutely vast. You're putting a lot of reliance on your reporting controls manager to feed you the information that you are making executive decisions on without the context. And that I find quite fascinating. You need someone who's sitting in the room providing the context to the reports that they are reading. Oh, it, it, the great thunks that be thunked in executive meetings are amazing. And the thoughts that be thought because you watch all these people around a room who, and I think I've said this to you as well before, Stuart, it fascinates me, who are reading a report. They are making vital executive management decisions on the outcomes of their business. But what they don't realise is their reporting report that they're reading is fiction. Yes. And they're making decisions based on a novel mm -hmm. <laughs> written by whomever the like, author is somewhere between their project controls manager who has the you know varying degrees of quality and they're making their decisions based on it mm -hmm. uh, without the context in the room and and that amazes me to watch mm -hmm. that happen I've, I've just sat there and i've come in to do assessments and i'll sit quietly i'll sit there and just observe um then you pick up the reports and you start to pick at them and you sit there and say, okay, how did you calculate the KPIs? How did you calculate hey, Why late tasks? How did, how, what are you looking at? And you start ferreting and think, my God, it's like it, it just disintegrates instantly because they've got what we all know as watermelon projects, you know, beautifully green on the outside, red in the middle because they're making everybody look nice and happy and we're all having a great time yet I'm sitting in the room. So why am I sitting in the room if we're looking at green reports? Mm -hmm. Because I've been called in by a CFO who said, hold it, my portfolio is like something in my company is, is I'm, I'm hemorrhaging money, go find it. And all the reports will tell me is, oh, everything's green. We all love each other, it's fabulous. You know? <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> there's rotten relationships in there. Someone's having wild affairs with someone else. Yeah, it was like yeah. another person's lying and no one spoke to Aunt Jess for months and you know, no one likes Uncle David anyway and no one keeps him, he's out drunk on the Christmas. Like there's just these, you, you rip open this this family of, of issues and you start to see that what's sunny on the outside is not so sunny on the inside. But we got there by deciding to walk through and blindly you know, make paint everything green. So, so uh, that's a really interesting point. So one of the one of the things is, um, and you, so you see this in project controls, and you see this in project prioritization mm -hmm. as well, right? You see it in both places where you you have numbers that are fiction, and yeah, yeah. Um, fiction. Yeah, so mean the, nothing. Yeah, that, that mean nothing. So on, on the prioritization side, there's there's yeah. you know, good ways of fixing that using AHP and things like this, which which can fix a lot of that. Um, uh, on on the project prioritize uh, on the project implementation side um do you have any thoughts on on sort of project methodologies ppm tools and the danger of blindly oh yeah i've got one this 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 you'll love this one 
Uh, so the fact that using, and it's not even, so the tool can be used and bastardized as well. Uh, this particular project, uh, Microsoft Enterprise, Project Enterprise, we're all on servers, everything's keyed up. Um, get your head around this one is that late, you're going to love it, late future tasks. Late future tasks. That, that's yeah. like al alternative facts, isn't it? Yes. So, so late future tasks is much, it's late future task is a task in the future that plan to is, be late <laughs> is, is, is planned at currently to be late apparently so but what it is is that inside when you yeah, I, know, I know so when you when you rip open what was happening in the report late future tasks report um it is that someone's gone in and actually decided that late tasks in accordance with the pro, uh, with the tool uh, is not adequate so they're going to put another macro in that recalculates late tasks but never split out future tasks that were late against a imposed baseline that were future so that's actually a quality we're not there yet so it's obvious that they can't be late so you yet you pick up a report at an executive level now, if you're at this, you imagine the percentage of, if you're at the start of a project, the percentage of your tasks that could therefore be verified as late, and you've got this red percentage that's like, we're late on 90% of our tasks. And it's like the project, but the project's running to, to plan, the, the, the project's on time, it's, it's fine. And the executive are getting these messages, no, it's 90% late. And it, but how? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you just picked off last week. How can you be this late now? Um, so yeah, tooling. And this is what I'm talking about when you're a, an executive um, at the top of the, and, and all you're relying on, you've got so much trust in the guy that's running your, you know, you, you, you can't, I can't underemphasize that you know, often they dare I say it, poorly paid BAs who are squirreling together the best efforts to uh, try and produce reports under pressure. Yet these reports are coming through because they're not either, you know, they're generally a lot of the PMOs you come across are not provided the um, resourcing or dynamic or have been set up or there's, I mean, there's a myriad of reasons. They're reporting POs, uh, PMOs, you've all, and I think anyone on the call or, or listening to this would have heard um, us speak about that before. Uh, the function of the PMO is, is just uh, administrative. So for all the lack of effort, um, energy, funding, or sort of focus that is given by the business, the executive then at the same time rely on those people to feed them the information by which they are get, then going to make changes to the business. It is an amazing dynamic to watch when you're invited into that arena. And you just sit there and think, you know, this is a, a GM and above, C-suite to board, taking the information from probably one of the least funded areas of their business that is absolutely going to make a difference to how they drive, manage and, and steer their business into the future. It, the dynamic is phenomenal. So, so coming back to the idea of a, a reporting PMO. So, so I heard a, I was at a project controls, heaven save me, a project controls conference mm. a year or two ago. And oh, there was, fun! There, there was a chat there, but a great, great talk actually. It was a really good talk. Yeah, yeah would um, be. And basically, what what he said is, look, you know, the data's fine. You know, it's a good starting point. But what yeah. you have to do in project controls or, or any or in the PMO, you know, that PMO leadership is you have to open the door, step out of your mm -hmm. office, walk mm -hmm. down the hallway yep. and talk to people to find out what's actually happening. Because yeah, if anyone... Actually, well, what's actually happening is not what's in the numbers. Guaranteed. No. Oh, I'll get a good one. Every, anyone, anyone who's going to look at this, who's ever worked with me will know I have a rule. Um, on reporting day, minimum, on reporting day, my PMO is to not have any bums on seats. 
I do, if it's a reporting day, I do I, that it should be empty. The office should be empty because those people should be, it's a service and they should be out there with, you know, making sure that they're getting the information in. But the story that comes to mind is where, and it was early on in my career, and I'm still friends, like I was actually working to a program director at the time who I'm still de dear friends with, uh, who <laughs> I followed to the men's loo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the only reason I realised was this door slammed in my face with a like a little outline of a, a man on it. I'm like, oh, I'm not loud in there. Um, I barreled him up. So what was happening? Uh, we our program we only had a window of two weeks to deliver every six months because it it was to do with the printing industry. So uh, there was some hard very hard constraints and we had a two week so we had to be able to get our go live to hit smack into that two week window uh i'd been down into the uh we were it was we, we were running through testing and the test manager was basically at the front smoking like a chimney stressed on a day and i'm like what's going on she said, everything's going on you know, the place is on fire, the emergency, bring, bring emergency services, this place is hell, everything's going out, and the best part, it's awful. Um, and then when I got our reports coming in, uh, all the defects were fine. We were hardly getting any. The report was green. And I'm like, this is weird. This is absolutely bizarre. Like, because you go and talk to the guy managing the whole thing, he's going grey. Uh, <laughs> and it, it just didn't add up. And then what we found out was that the girl who was doing the reports, and this is so fun, was actually having an affair with one of the testers. And she didn't, she thought that if we reported red, then the program would get the testers kicked off, <laughs> which isn't true, right? And everyone knows, we want to know what the defects are. We yeah. want to jump onto the defects. We want to go fix them. We, it, look, red's good. Red is good. That's good. That's years, right, yeah. Red is good. Give us the problems. We'll fix them. But it was just, she was new. She, she didn't, she just thought red was bad. I don't want it to be red. I don't want to change this dynamic that I've got in the office. And it was only that um, we started to notice they would leave at the same time and they would come to work at the same time and they'd go to lunch together. Um, and that, we started to unpick and it would have taken a couple of weeks, probably about two weeks to actually find out what was going on before we could confront her and say what was happening. Right. So I had to race after my, we've got problems. We're not going to go live. If we fix our testing, we've got to stop. Um, toilet door slam. <laughs> he listened to me later. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it, it just shows you, you've got to dig in. You don't, don't rely you need that context you need those stories we're human these things happen it is a living and breathing family so we've and got someone's gonna... so we've got the messages I, I love that story we've got the messages <laughs> that um you know it's got to be aligned with with strategy yep. so if it isn't we're going to do something about that probably kill it off um we've we've got to fix so verify the strategy verify the verify strategy the strategy and make sure it supports yeah. the strategy that we should be doing it we've we got to we're going to make sure people are talking to each other and that people are listening to each other yes, uh, uh we're not going to point fingers we're going to look forward not backwards right so mm -hmm. we're, we're going to really focus on fixing it and we're going to make sure that we're not just relying on numbers from a ppm tool that we actually yes. roll sleeves up and and get a hold of the reality of what's going on yes. in, in the project. So this is great. So we're getting some some idea of you know culturally how do we need to shift to get this thing moving forward again. So so we've, we've only got a few few minutes left. Here's a question. Um, you know what you've you've we've had conversations before about. Um, what causes projects to go wrong in the first place? So, so that might be a good way, you know, in, in, in terms of turning your project around, wouldn't it be nicer if it just didn't get into the poopy? Stuff? Yeah, I'd love that. I would love that. I would much prefer to be the person coming in and starting this off right than the person coming. It's like I walk in and go, God, people, clean your room. I cleaned it last week. I've come back. It's a complete mess. Did you not think and learn a thing? 
We're, we're going to change your nickname. No longer are you the mechanic. You're now mom. <laughs> I caught that once. I caught that work once. And yeah, it's look, people. It will always go crazy. Projects will always not quite be right. There will be some that will, you know, fall off a cliff. There will be some that float down from the cliff with a parachute attached uh, with a bit of a softer landing. Uh, look, then we can't have uh, projects. And that is because of people. Uh, it comes from recruiting the wrong person. We've all done that. Not exiting them well enough or quick enough once you realise they're not set up for success. Uh, it, it comes from communication breakdowns, uh, not, not being it, it, a myriad, the myriad of problems we have as humans are the myriad of problems we will have delivering projects. So we can never say, wouldn't it be lovely? It would be lovely. It'd be lovely if we could get rid of all the people. <laughs> if we could get rid of all, all the clients that the businesses work to. Um, and then we could probably run projects quite well. But until we have that sort of horribly awful utopian world, because I, I kind of like a little bit of crazy, as you can tell. Um, I... I don't mind the kaleidoscope of life and that's what our projects are so yeah they're not going to go right but I guess the other thing is in that case be aware of what you do through prioritization tooling through other ppm tool support and through the people you call on to actually get them resolved because I think that's that's where we're starting as an industry to fall apart uh, we, we're not really, I, I suppose, in, just to be probably provocative, you, most other industries have now ended up having to have some form of, you know, I don't want to say regulatory body because I'm, I'm sort of against it a bit, but our quality standards are varying, let's just say. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, yeah, people have to be quite considered about who they go for their help, where they go for their tools, where they get their advice from. And yeah, yeah I mean, you can Google a lot of this stuff if you're willing. We actually, I had a bit of fun last night. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. I was sitting down with my husband and uh, what were we doing? Oh, just for good measure, we decided to work out if blue whales could be constipated. <laughs> <laughs> So he picks up Google and he's asking Google and apparently the answer is yes. But I said, how could like, I don't get this? I said, how can you research? believe? Who did that research? Pardon? Who did that? I have, exactly. and, and because what, he would have straight in Google. Put, I was more What did they put on I the was more amazed proposal? that it was in there. Well, apparently there's all these paperwork done, the scientists have worked out if it didn't say blue whales, it just said whales um, could could be constipated. So I'm like, okay. Um, and then I'll let you in on a personal secret is uh, I, I don't have the most religiously um, affiliated uh, husband. Uh, so I made him then say, Google is God real. And uh, which I knew would rev him up, right? And, <laughs> and, and apparently 90% uh, yes, uh, God's real. So I said, well, look, if you, don't, um, if you don't agree with that premise, then how can you justify that your original um, information you were provided uh, is just as why, why do you believe response one uh, and not response two in, in actual fact? So, uh, yeah, you can Google what you like. <laughs> I'd still check and do a bit of research myself and probably dig a bit further than the first three nice. lists <laughs> that nice. you get. I like it. I like it. And now um, you know, just for good measure, that uh, whales can get constipated. Blue, blue, whales, blue whales can be constipated. That, that's that's excellent. I will I will be far more. That is not my job. <laughs> yeah, far more productive today in my job knowing that. Um, so so there's one one other thing that I think is uh, on that topic of um, avoiding it going bad in the first place. Um, yeah. And I think this one this one sort of is is quite a big one. Um, do you want to talk for a minute mm. about project dependencies and the the? Ooh, I and like the, them. 
the link to pro to risk in the project. You you know I love this. Yeah, I know where the buttons are. I know where the buttons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, project dependencies. You know, you're not going to say the next thing is I am sick and tired of listening to uh, a risk. We're going to put a risk register together, load a waffle. If you're running your project in risk, you're running a little behind the times. You never let a project get into, you are managing in risk. If you want it to land in the risk register when you're managing it, you're managing in risk. You're not managing, you know, manage in dependency because dependency becomes risk, becomes issue. You front load your, your management style and you are managing in dependency. You should have next to nothing coming into risk. Yeah, you, you want to front foot it. And and I think I've said to you before, Scott, I think it's like, imagine those really, really, really skinny um, roads up in, you know, the Himalayan roads and it's like a cliff. It, it, it would kind of be like driving on your holiday trek with one wheel hanging in the off, one, off the side of that cliff. How comfortable is your delivery going to be if you want to manage in risk? It blows my mind that people do this. Get yourself a dependency register, shove your dependencies in it, put your receiver supplier in there and manage your dependencies. You risk, actually, and the other thing is have someone who knows what they're talking about. I've got a current, we had a circular argument recently about a business um, risk. So the risk for, the, the risk as it was provided could only be actioned by the business. It was actually to do with operational staff. Um, and you know extension of, of working and I said well that's a business risk because the business it has to live with the business because only the business can action that oh but it's a it's a it's a risk to the program I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I understand the impact but the I cannot fix it as a as a as a program person um, I am not empowered to extend operational staff contracts or work environments or, or EBAs or that's project has to hand that over to the now we were in this circular discussion for about 45 minutes and I, I promise you I didn't get out of it I've ended up just going leave it I'll take it up to a, the next governance um, committee and we'll have it transferred there because uh, so uh, somewhat you need and that's why I'm saying it, it comes down to people as well. Um, good talent. Uh, you know, take on the talent you can afford to take to deliver the program you need. More people, sometimes it's better to have, like, not more people to get the project done, but fewer quality people. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. To yeah. be more effective to get that happening. I've got a... Um, I've always been concerned, go lives, for example, from an IT perspective, if we're running an implementation, too many people, they all of a sudden everyone gets worried about it. And they're trying to get people in. Oh, we'll get we'll get helpers in. We'll get someone to coordinate this. We'll get too many people in the control room. You've got so much coordination, no one's coordinated, you're hurting cats. I actually like to dial back when we're when we're in those really high and intense periods and go, okay, we only want five to seven people in here and we're going to get this done. So yeah, people, dependencies. Yeah. Dependency, people manage depend. dependency and get key that's people it. in. That's it. That that's it. So the, the the people are the enabler and the, the dependency is the process, right? And and off you go. Um, you know, PMBOK, PMI, job done. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Recipe for the <laughs> easy. Well, as 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 it's usual. Easy. As usual, we've had a bit of a laugh. We've gone all over the place. I, I think we sort of vaguely stuck to topic this time, yeah. um, but uh, but it's been it's been really great. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, no, thanks, Julie. And and if people want to get hold of you and uh, avail themselves of your wisdom and knowledge and services, oh, where on should, LinkedIn. Where should they go hunting? Google. <laughs> Google. You can't miss me. Excellent. But I'm always happy to talk to anyone who can. Um, but ping me on LinkedIn usually is the quickest way. Brilliant. So Amanda Oakenfall on LinkedIn. And, on LinkedIn. Uh, and there's that, there's uh, not very many of I think there's only two Amanda Oakenfalls in the world, so I'm aware of. So you tend to be able to find me. 
Has the other one sent you any death threats yet? No. I think she's a doctor. She's not really professional. And oh, gosh. Oh, well, I guess one, like that. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again, Amanda. And, um, uh, and to everybody listening, thanks for joining us and watch out for the next webinar. See you soon.